make room for you to move. Open our eyes to see your glory, drawing us deeper into you. One of the uh, major epidemics these days, it's not Zika virus, it's not uh, cholera, it's not dengue, especially if it's been raining recently, but it's, it's this thing right here, it's fatherlessness. It's, it's uh, swept around the globe, uh, of course, America, Europe, even here in the Philippines. And it's very unfortunate that we have seen this uh, in increasing and accelerating ratio and rate because of, you know, people or even dads moving to another country because of work. And again, uh, that's a need that, that, that has, uh, has, has happened or they have. Uh, but unfortunately, it had unintended consequences. And so even for my own life, as I've grown up without a father, uh, it has become a, a struggle. And, and it's, unfortunately that, uh, it's unfortunate that how we view our Heavenly Father is directly related upon how we view our earthly father. And so, um, and for, it's for me, uh, that has been the case. In fact, I was listening to or reading an article by Uprising. It was a, it was a, a conference that happened last year, a youth prayer conference. And it talked about the, the young people being under attack and Filipinos are not exempted. Talking about with the advancing technology and van vanishing father-child connection, we are witnessing a generation raised mainly by the media. Young people are losing their sense of identity and destiny. Instead, they are bound to lust, sexual immorality, abortion, dysfunctional families, and even child abuse and exploitation. And, and we see the young people, as, as, as the article was saying, uh, being raised by media today, where new, uh, Netflix and YouTube are, being the, uh, are, are parenting our children today. N nothing, that, uh, nothing wrong with Netflix or YouTube. Uh, I mean, we watch uh, Netflix, but it's, it's when we relegate uh, media to become the electronic babysitters of our children. And so uh, part of the article was, was saying uh, 10 Filipino teenagers attempt to commit suicide every day. And this is a, a, such a staggering, heartbreaking uh, statistic. Uh, one woman or child is being raped in the Philippines every 53 minutes. 800 babies are being aborted in the country every single year. 800,000, that's a lot. 130,000 children in the Philippines are living on the streets. And these are, these are statistics. And you know, when you, when you drive down, down uh, maybe let's say, you know, a street down in Manila, here in Manila, and there's a traffic light, how many of you know it can get, uh, what's the word, uh, desensitized, where we become desensitized when we see these kinds of everyday uh, you know, occurrences in, in life. Uh, but but uh, even Huffington Post uh, uh, released an article talking about teen depression in girls linked to absent fathers in early childhood. Now, obviously, this is just an aspect, and it's not. Uh, it's just one of the contributing factors to depression, which I know in the recent times have been a, a huge uh, social issue, not just in this country but all over the world wherein you hear um, recent high-profile uh, celebrities have taken their own life, and it's, it's heartbreaking to hear uh, these kinds of news and, and, and these kinds of um, um, occurrences, as I've said. Uh, and while it is not the only contributing factor, there are many others. Um, I know there's clinical and medical, there's, um, there's, there's uh, social, uh, emotional uh, factors, but, but this is a major contributing factor, as this... Uh, article was saying. By the way, um, just in case, I didn't put it on the slide here, but if you could flash on the screen. Um, just in case, uh, we've actually partnered uh, Dr. Kim Pasqual, uh, the director of Operation Blessing and 700 Club. Uh, we've partnered with them, and so just in case you know anybody um, who needs somebody to talk to, uh, there are counselors and, and advisors and biblical counselors that can, uh, they can talk to. Uh, and so we'll post this on social media platforms of Victory. Uh, so just in case you have, uh, you have people that, sh that might need this information. Um, also, the next slide, I think there's another one. Um, our offices will be open uh, Tuesday to Sunday. Uh, you can call these numbers. And just in case you want to connect somebody who 
uh, who, who need somebody to talk to um, will, will be here as a church. How many of you know the church has to be here to, to hear and to listen and to, uh, to, to bridge uh, them to, to Christ? And, but anyway, going back to that article with uh, Huffington Post talking about team depression, um, it's the, 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 the study that was done in UK, this was in University of Bristol, talking about, you know, sometimes the, the, the pressure the, the young people have in terms of, um, you know, comparison or comparing, you know, too good to be true kind of posts. You know, that's why you have these hashtag goals, right? Relationship goals, marriage goals, friendship goals, vacation goals, house goals. Everything now is becoming a goal because they, we now compare what we have to what others have, not realizing that they're comparing what they have to other people, right? So, major, major uh, situation and social concern today. And so as we look at the scriptures today, uh, we want to look at Galatians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 8. What does the Bible have to say? That now as sons and daughters of the King, as children who have put their faith in Christ, as we have given our lives to Christ and received and embraced uh, Christ as Lord and Savior, what does that mean for us now that we've been adopted into the family of God? And such a one of the most powerful uh, teachings in Scripture is this one right here. It's, it's about, uh, about adoption, all right? And, then, and so Galatians chapter 4, the Bible says in verse 4, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And so... Uh, Paul was talking to the, the churches in Galatia, saying that at the, at the right time, at the fullness of time, God sent His Son, right? When, when the Roman roads are all set and when there was peace and, 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 and the gospel could be spread, right at the proper time, God sends His Son. And the apex and the climax of why Jesus Christ died, suffered, okay, resurrected from the dead is so that we can be part of his family, so that we can be adopted into the, the family of God. And then verse, uh, uh, it says, as, as sons, um, uh, you know, in, 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 the Roman, in the Roman life, it was commonly practiced. In fact, there were emperors who would adopt uh, sons, men who were not uh, their own children, and, that, and then what they would do is they would give them authority, they would give them position, they would give them this name, all right? And because they were adopted and they had their full rights as a biological son. And so this was commonly practiced in the, Lom uh, in the Roman world. And so when Paul was talking about this, they understood what this meant. That though they were not biological sons, they had the same name, same inheritance, same rights as full biological sons. And what Paul was saying made sense. And now everybody's being, you know, uh, Paul was telling everyone, understand that this is your case when God adopted you as a son. And you see, the marvelous claim of Christianity is that we can be adopted into God's family through the redemption of Christ in Calvary. This is an incredible claim. What are you talking about? The God of the universe who created the heavens and the earth. Now He is my Father. I've rebelled against Him. I've offended Him. I have sinned against Him. I have done things to, uh, that was repulsive to Him. And yet now He has made a way so that I can be with Him and be reconciled back to Him. And then He's also getting me into His family. And on top of that, I am co-heirs with Christ. And on, to on top of that, I have full rights as son or a daughter of the king. How ridiculous is that? And what an incredible claim that we are now part of his family. If you remember the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, the, the son finished all the inheritance, brought, you know, brought the, the inheritance into wild living, and then he wanted to come back because he said, my, my, you know, my father's hired hand or workers would eat every day, three times a day, and with good meal, right? So he went back, and the father accepted him. Guess who was grumpy and upset? The older brother, right? The older brother was upset. Why? Because he squandered into wild living all his inheritance, and now he gets a ring, he gets a robe, and he gets fattened calves. 
Where is that coming from? That's coming from my inheritance. That's why he was upset. He's being accepted. He was dead but now alive, right? And so he was being accepted, but he's using up the inheritance that was supposed to be mine. He was a grumpy older brother. But you know, Jesus is not like the... Gr he is the older brother, but he's not the grumpy older brother because in spite of our rebellion, he accepts us and at his expense allows us to be grafted in and brought into the family through his death, suffering, and resurrection. How many of you know that's something to celebrate and that's something to thank God for? A sons and daughters of the king. I love what J.I. Packer said. Theologian J.I. Packer she said, what is a Christian? The richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. That's a powerful statement right there. And if there is, you see, Christianity is the only religion, if you can even call that, that. It's the only religion that will, that offers a very intimate relationship with its master. That's what we, we have today. And then the Bible says in verse 6, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of, son, of his son into our hearts. The spirit of his son into our hearts by which we can cry, Abba, Father. Right? We can cry, Abba, Father. We can call him Dad. Abba. That's why you can be a dancing queen, right? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Okay. You can dance, you can jive, okay? <laughs> Having a time of your life. Okay, okay. Oh, that's enough, that's enough. Sorry, Joe. You're no longer a slave, but a son. And so now here Paul is saying, guys, don't st you, you are, you're adopted and you're, you're in the family. Stop thinking like a slave. You are a child. And let me tell you something, you all here, if you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, you have faith in Christ, you are a child of God. Don't, don't live as a slave. Live as a son, as a daughter. And, and when, when Paul was talking about sonship, he, he didn't mean, you know, there, you know, it didn't mean like, you know, women and men, are, are, there was no equality there. Basically, the full rights in a very patriarchal society. You are being given the full rights as sons. And so that's what he was meaning. And when you talk about well, you're no longer having a slave mentality but a son mentality, what are the privileges that you and I have? Let me list down a few. Um, fearlessness. Let's talk about this for a moment. Romans chapter 8. We'll jump to Romans uh, chapter 8. What the Bible says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you receive the spirit of sonship by him we call Abba Father. He's repeating himself in Romans. Same thing he said in Galatians. He said, because it was during those days, if you were a Jew, there were 600 plus laws that you had to obey. Right? And so you have to measure up. And if you couldn't measure up, you cannot enter into the temple courts. That's why the priests had to sacrifice because you offended God and you, you could not meet the standards and that's why the blood of the lamb was sacrificed onto the altar so that you can now enter into the presence of God. That's what the, the, the practice was. And so now because you can meet up, now you've, there's always a sense of fear. What if I don't make, meet the expectation? So I have to perform that's why a slave will live in fear, but sons will live in freedom. One who is living in fear is like, I don't know, maybe God will reject me. I don't know, maybe if I don't perform enough, I will not be accepted. I have to be lovable and accepted. I have to look good. I have to always do these things so that God will accept me. How many of you know that's exhausting? It's utterly exhausting. If you're trying to work for a God or for a master. But you see, that's not your father in heaven. Your father in heaven through Christ has accepted you. That's why a slave mentality says, if I perform, I feel great about myself because I feel accepted. But the son mentality, I'm accepted because of what 
because, not because of my performance, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. Not only that, you will tend to be critical and judgmental if you are of a slave mentality. What's that mean? Because I don't feel accepted, then, then I will need to feel superior over another person. Right? And so now I have to say things to make me look better, and I'll become judgmental and critical of another person. Whether that be their clothing, their hairstyle, their car, their business address, their school, their accent. We, we laugh about people's accent. We look down on people because now we think we're better. We, we need to feel superior because we don't feel accepted. But if you feel accepted by God, you don't have to be critical or judgmental. You can say, Lord, thank you for accepting me for who I am. In humility and in, in affirmation, I have, I have been accepted by the Father. A son or a daughter of the king understands acceptance doesn't come by comparing. Because we'll fall into the comparison trap. I feel better about myself if I advance more than the others. That's a lie. But a son or a child or a daughter affirms others and is secure about other people advancing. It's okay. Because God has plans for me. You now become secure about your calling. You're secure about how you look. You're secure about your season in life. Even if somebody's, you know, you're in the same batch or your same class, he's advanced. Let's say you're in the military or in, your, in, in the corporate. He's, he seems to be advancing faster. That's okay. God has something for me. How many of you know this is incredibly free for some of us? Slaves will tend to be defensive and controlling. I have to be, I have to be, I have to control my image, my, uh, my posts. People need to see I'm lovable, acceptable, I am good. Okay, I have to manage my reputation. And if somebody brings up something about me, what are you talking about? No, I'm not like that. Who told you that? Stop that. That's not a wrong, that's, that's a wrong accusation. And so we become defensive. But one who, who is a son will live in humility and repentance. You know why? Because you know who you are in Christ. And you know who you really are apart from Christ. That's why you can be in humility and say, oh, you know, it's okay. Apart from Christ, I am nothing. Apart from Christ, I'm good for nothing. John 15. Everything after salvation is bonus. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm accepted. God loves me. I can be secure in my season. I can be secure in my calling. You know, um, this week I got, my family and I got to visit Archie. We were in Melbourne. Archie was our, uh, our music director here for, for the longest time. The guy in the extreme left and he tried... He cooked uh, lamb chops and uh, steak for us, Angus. No? Uh, but the guy in the gray, gray sweater, uh, Mark, he grew up in, uh, in Los Baños, uh, was discipled in our church in Victory, Los Baños. Really, uh, but long story short, he was in a work, uh, in a job where um, he needed to move on because uh, without going to the full details, um, what he was trying to do, he's trying to help the others uh, who were in his team to grow in their, uh, in their, in their position. And, and the, the, the owner of the company was just so surprised uh, because why are you doing this? this? If you do this to the others, they'll advance quicker and faster than you. And he says, that's not the point. He says, the point is to grow the company. The point is to expand the work. The, the point is uh, to help you grow your company. It's not about self-advancement. I'm helping them so that they can be better. And so I thought, I mean, he wasn't telling that to me to brag. He was telling that to me as a matter of fact. A guy that was discipled in his teen years thinks right. I'm not here to just self-advance, but I'm here to help others I'm serving, he says. 
How many of you know you can serve God in the workplace? He was worshiping God in the workplace. He was serving Jesus in the workplace. Fearlessness. Number two, access. Verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. By Him. It's through the Spirit of God. Access has been granted. I told you about the temple and the tabernacle. You know, uh, the first picture in the, uh, in the, in the uh, top talks about, uh, you see there, uh, there's the outer courts where the people are in, uh, allowed to get in. But when you get into the, the tabernacle, it's divided into two, the holy place and the most holy place. The most holy place is where the Ark of the Covenant that represent the, the presence of God. And so the, the, the regular priests would be in the holy place, but the high priest, once a year, gets to go into the uh, Holy of Holies. And so, but the Bible says when Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, Hebrews says, when he died on the cross, the curtain that separates the, pla the holy place and the most holy place was torn top to bottom. That means all of us now can enter into the most holy place, into the presence of God. Through Jesus Christ, we don't have to go through a high priest. We don't have to go through a pastor. We don't have to go through a religious leader, a small group leader. We can go straight to God. We can talk to Jesus. We can talk to God in Jesus' name. And we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word that, says, that means daddy. Or as my daughter would call me before, dada, when she was a kid. Or papa or papi. Okay, it's, a, it's a term of endearment. It was a, when, when, when a son or a daughter calls his or her dad. And it was, it was actually offensive to some of the Jews. Why call the creator of the heaven and the earth? Papa, daddy. That's such a disrespectful title. But Jesus himself said we can call him our father. You know, one of the most powerful pictures you can have is this one right here. JFK and JFK Jr. playing under his table. At that time, okay, JFK, the youngest president ever elected, um, was able to negotiate with President Khrushchev of Soviet Union and stop and avert a nuclear war. Not only that, he was able to take uh, the United States out of a recession, economic recession. With all the work on his table, his son was playing under the table. His son didn't have to go to the secretary and say, Dad, can I play under your table? Miss, you know, didn't have to call the secretary. You see, when you go to your father, you don't have to go to a secretary. You can go straight to the Father in heaven. Last, me and my dad camp. Um, you know, of course, the... The, the tents were right beside each other, right? And, and you would hear, well, you could hear a symphony in the evening because the dads were all snoring, right? Okay. <laughs> but beyond that symphony, okay, every so often, you would hear, Dad, I'm thirsty. Because, you know, we're divided by just, what tent? Nylon? Is that made of whatever fabric it's made of? Okay, so we're right beside you. Dad, I gotta go wee wee. <laughs> so you hear six year olds, okay, uh, you know, in the middle of the night. And let me tell you, these dads, some of them own their businesses, some of them are sales managers, supervisors, directors of their company. They lead teams and units, they have their own assistants. But when son or daughter, a six year old, would say, Dad, wee wee. They would, they would be on their feet bringing their kids to the toilet or getting a, a drink for them. The child doesn't stop and say, wait, 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 wait. I need to call your secretary, dad. I need to go to wee wee first. Okay? No, no need for that. They can go straight to that. See, the access we've been given dictates the audacity we will have. When we understand the access we have, then we can go to God and say, Lord, you said, Heavenly Father, you said, my dear God, you said, 
you can be audacious and bold and courageous to come into his presence and say, Lord, this is what your word says. And because you said this, Lord, I, I can believe, Lord, I can trust you for my father's healing. I can trust you, Lord, that you will, you will save my daughter from, from her depression. Lord, you will, you will help my business grow. You will uh, save me from this financial debt. How many of you know this opens up a new level of boldness when you realize you've been adopted and you have the full rights as a son and a daughter? And finally, let me wrap it up with this one, inheritance. The privileges that you guys, we have, all of us have as a child of God, fearlessness, access, and of course, inheritance. Let's, now, Romans chapter 8. I, I, I hope when you get home, if you can get the chance to read the whole chapter. It starts off, no condemnation in Christ. Those, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. And so... I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Not just around us, that the glory of God will be revealed in us. What's he talking about? Okay, verse 19, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Let me give you a background of what Paul is saying to the church in Rome. When sin entered the world, corruption entered when corruption entered, everything now goes into decay. That's why you have the second law of thermodynamics, that there's increasing entropy in the world from order to disorder, right? From perfection to corruption. You, you check your room, okay, or your study desk, okay? You fix it the next week, it's messy again, right? And so just w whether that would be our bodies, Okay, wrinkly, flabby, okay, you need to put makeup or haircut or whatever, okay? Because of the corruption. And the Bible says the crea creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Now, verse 20, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay one day. Okay, look at the person beside you, okay? One day, all right? Our bodies, okay, will no longer be the way it is. No, that's why Revelation says no sickness, no illness, no death, no mourning. For the old order of things have become new. And so he says there, bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God, we know that the whole creation has been groaning. How many of you, your bodies groan sometimes? Ah, ah, As in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And then, <clears throat> verse 20, verse 23, not only do uh, so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, adoption of the sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, wait, Paolo, I thought we were legally adopted into the family of God. Isn't that past tense? <clears throat> You'll notice in Scripture, there's the, uh, there's the alreadiness of the not yet. The kingdom of God is here, but not yet. Okay? We've been adopted as sons legally. Positionally, we're adopted, but experientially. Okay? What will happen, he says here, is that we will, uh, we will be adopted fully, the redemption of our, our bodies, when the time comes. Let me give you an example. A, a dad who adopts a son okay, in this day and age. He has full rights as son, same name, last name, inheritance, everything, okay? Access in the refrigerator, okay? Own room in the house. But there's one thing he cannot give him. Everything he can give, money, education, as the other biological children, but there's one thing he can't give him. What is that? His DNA. But you see, one day, when the time comes, this body is going to be renewed. The Bible says in Corinthians, though outwardly we're, being, we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed. That one day we will become an image and likeness of God. The, 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 old, uh, the, the original intent that God had for every single one of us. A couple of years ago, I read a book entitled Washed and Waiting. It's a guy named Wesley Hill. Um, fascinating story because he grew up in a Christian home. 
um, and he has a PhD now. He's, he's actually from Wheaton, okay? And uh, he, he grew up in, in a Christian home, but in his teenage life, or even, even when he was in the 20s, he struggled with homosexuality. He struggled with same-sex attraction. And, and I think he had some relationships. And, and he said, I, I struggled with that thought. He said, because um, I was a Christian, but I had these things inside of my heart. And I couldn't understand it. All right? Until he said, I came across this, these verses. And he said, that's why the premise of the book, I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. Because ever since he surrendered his life to Christ, and he, again, he grew up in a Christian home. He struggled, but when he made a decision to fully surrender his life to Christ, he no longer, he, he remained celibate, but he still struggled with these things in his heart. Okay? And he said, that's why the premise of the book, Washed and Waiting, I've been washed by the blood of Jesus, and I'm waiting eagerly for the redemption of this body, that one day, this struggle will be no more. And it was a fascinating illustration that he gave because if you had a silver platter and you had several wine glasses on, on top of that and you, let's say you trip, right? And then all those glasses fall to the ground, they don't break the same way. Some will be on the tip, some will be in the mouth, some will be in the bottom, on the stem. Different ways they will be broken. You see, that's how sin has broken us. Sin has broken us differently. Some, it's greed. It's not so seen as the other sins. Some, it's greed. Some, it's pride. Some, it's lust. Some, it's sexual immorality. Some, it's homosexuality. Some, it's adultery. Some, it's, it's murder, even in your mind. Some, it's selfishness. All these sins were broken differently. But one day, listen to me, one day, we will be redeemed. When Jesus Christ comes and restores His kingdom, the old order of things will be gone. Behold, the new things have come. Somebody say amen to that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. But, and as they come up, I'm going to ask us to worship and sing to the Lord today. Let me give you a couple of applications as we end. Number one, because God is my Father, I can live in freedom from fear. That I don't need to measure up because somebody measured up on my behalf. That my moral report card was a failure. But when Jesus imputed His moral report card on me, I'm now accepted by the Father. I don't have to perform. Nothing to prove, no one to impress. Number two, because God is my Father, I can boldly ask, hopefully this revolutionizes the way you pray, that you can go to God and say, Lord Jesus, thank you that I have access, that I can talk to the Father through you. And because you said so, ask and you shall receive. And whatever you ask in my name, my Father will do it for you. And then, not only that, because God is my Father, I can face suffering with grace. That the redemption of my body soon will happen. Cancer, if I have cancer today, one day, one day, cancer free. If I'm struggling with asthma, I'm struggling with polio, I'm struggling with whatever situation you have today, I can face it gracefully, not grudgingly, because I know one day everything will be made new. If there's things that's going on in your heart today, it's like, I don't understand why this is going on. I want to please God, but it seems like the pull is too strong. Listen, one day that struggle is going to be gone. You are a son, a daughter. You're no longer a slave. I hope this is liberating for some of us. Because if we embrace this, we will understand. And even the struggle, the, the, the hardship that you go through, let me give you a thought. A master punishes, but a father disciplines. Huge difference. If you have the slave mentality, you think of God as a master who punishes you. 
But if you understand you're a son or your daughter of a king, he doesn't punish you. He disciplines you. Hebrews chapter 12 says, no discipline is blessing, but painful. Everybody say painful. But it will yield a harvest of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so the chastisement or the, the suffering or the whatever you're going through today, you know, you can just, it's hard, it's difficult, but you know, my father has my back because he knows the plans he has for me. He's my daddy. He's my Abba. And because of the relationship I have with him, I can trust him. Do you trust him? Can we all stand? I'm going to ask them to sing this song and then I'll come back and I'll pray. There's no other name I know in my weakness powerful be to you only you who will never leave my side in the quiet in the fight it's you judges the thoughts and the intent of our hearts and yet it breaks whatever hardness of heart we have I want to pray for two groups of people today some of you here today um, there's a fear there's a fear that's gripped your heart and I don't know what that is. maybe it's rejection it's maybe if you don't measure up or if, if you fail or fear because uh, of, of, of a master that wants to punish but he's not a master who wants to punish he's a father who loves and accepts you for who you are so I want to break that fear today and that, that even just how exhausting performance can be my prayer would be that you would just enjoy your relationship with your father just the way he loves a child a uh, father would love a child is how he loves every single one of you. And let me let me pray. Just bow your heads. If you are here today, if you're saying, you know, Pastor Paul, I just I want to break that fear of performance, of failure, of of trying to please people. I've become a man pleaser because I think it's the way for me to be accepted. But now I know because of what Christ has done and because of the Father accepting me. I can be who I am in Him. If that's you, just lift up your hand. I want to pray for you. I just want to pray for some of you. Lord, I pray for every person in this room lifting up their hands. Lord, we break every fear, every spirit of fear. We break that in the name of Jesus. And we say they are accepted. Whatever rejection that they have experienced in the past, father leaving, mother abandoning, 
brother or sister or boyfriend, girlfriend, friend. We break every abandonment. We break every uh, hurt or fear of being hurt or fear of performance or failing. We break that in the name of Jesus. And we say, God, that they are accepted. They don't have to perform. Nothing to prove. No one to impress. Lord, our desire now is to just bring pleasure to your name because of what you've done for us. You can put your hands down. One more group of people I want to pray for. If you're going through a difficult season, I want to pray that God will give you grace, that gracefully you will enter uh, through this season and finish this season and know that your Father in heaven has great plans for you. It may be discipline time, but it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Your father will bring you back into his lap and say, I'm your dad. I'm going to take care of you. I love you. I accept you. Trust me. I'm with you. I have not left your side. Lord, I pray. If that's you, just lift up your hands. Lord, I pray for Lord, the men and the women who are lifting up their hands today, even those who are watching online. I pray, Lord, that as they go through a difficult season, Lord, you said you will prune so we can become more fruitful. You will cut off some branches so we can bear much fruit. You will discipline so that we can be who you've called us to be and walk into the destiny that you've planned for us. Let us not despise discipline, Lord. Let us embrace it because we have a Father who loves us. How great is the Father's love that we shall be called His children. You have lavished your love for us. So Lord, I bless everyone as we leave today. In Jesus' name. You can put your hands down. If we could just flash the one last verse I want to show you. Let me pray for you. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead, the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing His will. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Everybody say, Amen. Amen.